Welcome to the third of our five Ready for Business webinars in partnership with the Cayman Islands government. My name is Will Pano. I'm the Chief Executive of the Chamber of Commerce. Before we begin, I, I would like to remind you of a few Zoom rules. I would ask you to um, keep your camera off during the presentation as well as your microphone. And I'd also just like to ask you if you could um, just be aware that this is being recorded and will be actually rebroadcast and, and issued on the internet. So if by agreeing to watch and to participate in this, in this webinar, you agree that this can, your image or your name will be broadcast over the internet and shared by other organizations. So we invite you to put your questions in the chat feature which is located in the bottom of the Zoom panel. Um, and you'll have the opportunity to hear our speakers first, and they'll, but they'll respond to your questions throughout the presentation in the chat. So the Ready for Business webinar series has been developed to help employers and employees prepare for the reopening of our borders and the coexistence with COVID-19. The Chamber of Commerce represents more than 600 businesses in the Cayman Islands and we continue to offer guidance and support, standing as a trusted source of information uh, for the business community. We know there is a much to be done to help us prepare for your organization for our new normal. So it's important that we continue to work together to provide you with most update, most, most up-to-date information. So I'd like to thank you for joining us for best practices and protocols for COVID-19 safety in the workplace for the office, service, and retail sectors. Today, we'll go into health and safety protocols that employers in the office, social, and tour and sectors will be required to implement based on best practices and procedures as approved by the public health authorities. So the format of today's webinar will be a 30, 20 to 30 minute presentation, followed by a question and answer period. Today's speakers will try to answer as many questions as possible in the chat feature, but at the end of it, you'll also can turn your mic on. And we'll also accept your questions that way as well. So today, today's presentation will be presented by Cliff Robinson. He's the Environmental Health Officer at Public Health. Cliff has 14 years experience as an Environmental Health Officer and is currently employed with Public Health to complement the staff on the COVID-19 response in the Cayman Islands. His main focus is institutional health, food safety, occupational health and safety, and vector control. He'll be joined by Therese Prehe, who is the health promotion officer at the HSA, Health Services Authority, with primary responsibility for planning and coordinating the national health promotion programs and strategies on behalf of the Ministry of Health. Timothy McLaughlin, will also be with us in today's session. He's a senior public health surveillance officer and deputy national epi epidemiologist, and he is regarded as an expert in communicable disease surveillance and epide epidemi epidemiology. <laughs> Sorry about that, it's a tough word. And remind you that we are recording all webinars and we're recording the webinar, and it'll be available for a rewatch on the Chamber website and other channels um, on YouTube and, and other social media platforms. So I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Public Health and Cliff. All right, thank you, Will. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me start off by saying thank you guys for having this forum where we can share this type of information with stakeholders. Um, as we try to get back to normal, we'll realize that we're actually far from getting back to normal um, with things that we're expected to do in our workplaces, in our, um, in our homes, in our communities, everywhere in order to prevent and control the spread of COVID-19. So, let me commend you guys for this initiative, for the stakeholder collaboration that's going on to get this information out there to um, stakeholders and the public in general. Um, let me go ahead and 
share screen. Okay, so we're looking at best practices and protocols for COVID-19 safety in the workplace. And this is very, very important because we have seen where COVID can cause an entire workforce to be out of work. And we know the implications of that with the economic situations, with people being out of work, with businesses not being able to earn. So as we, for want of a better word, say we're getting back to normal, it's good to have these public health measures in place so that we know how to control and prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our workplaces. Um, so for this presentation, um, we're gonna be looking at COVID-19 infection prevention and control measures in the workplace. <clears throat> so we'll be looking at control measures that we can institute that we're required to implement in our workplaces in order to prevent spread of COVID-19, in order to protect workers, in order to protect your customers and guests. So we'll be assessing the risk of transmission at work. And we'll also be looking at safer and healthier workplaces. So measures that we can implement in the workplaces to ensure that our workforce is protected. So some of the objectives, uh, we're gonna be able to understand actions based on the hierarchy of control that can be used to ensure workplaces are COVID-19 safe. And that's in quotes, of course. Um, we'll be looking at, we'll be able to understand the things to consider when assessing the risk of exposure in the workplace and things to consider with respect to COVID-19 safe cleaning regime in the workplace. So cleaning and sanitization, disinfection, and so forth. So in public health, there is what we call the biological triad. That's the interaction between the host agent and the environment. And of course, the environment that we're looking at today is the workplace. And with the biological triad, the interaction between the host agent and the environment is how diseases are able to be spread. So control measures at the level of the host, at the level of the environment, which is our workplace in this instance, or the agent, once we can effectively understand and implement control measures, this is how we will be able to control and spread, control the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. So we're looking at things like physical distancing, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, wearing mask, proper ventilation in the workplace. So these are some of the general control measures that we will be looking at. Um, in terms of infection prevention and control measures, there's what we call the hierarchy of control. And it ranges from elimination of the, the hazard, substitution of the hazard, engineering controls, administrative controls and wearing PPE. And we realize that the most effective ones at the top, and it ranges to the bottom with the least effective, which of course is what we tend to focus on most, which is wearing PPE. In preventing the spread of any disease, PPE is usually the least effective because what that would mean is that we are, we are putting ourselves to be exposed to this hazard and then wearing personal protective equipment would prevent us from contracting this disease. So if we were to start at the top to eliminate the hazard, we're looking at el elimination of the transmission at the work, which can be best accomplished by encouraging work from home. Now, this would be the similar situation to when we have lockdowns and of course, at this point, we have moved away from measures that strict in terms of locking down. So we're looking at going back into the workforce. So in our, in our situation, no, we wouldn't be looking at elimination unless of course there are persons in the workplace who are immunocompromised, who are higher at, or at higher risk for contracting COVID-19 or from complications resulting from COVID-19. So those persons, 
we can remove them from the workplace and that's how we would eliminate the hazard for those persons. Substitution, this is where we could replace the hazard. Now, of course, there's no replacing COVID-19 because mm -hmm. we can't substitute COVID-19 for another um, infection. So in, in, with respect to COVID-19, substitution would not apply. So our main focus for this presentation are going to be engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. So the engineering controls that we'll be looking at are measures like ventilation, which should be functioning well and maintained. We're looking at things like windows, physical things that we can put in place, barriers to control the spread of COVID-19. Administrative controls are things like persons not coming to work, staggered work hours, and of course, PPE, such as wearing masks and personal protective equipment. So for, already spoke of this, for our elimination, we're looking at elimination of transmission at work, which can be best accomplished by working from home. Substitution, which does not apply. The engineering controls to ensure ventilation systems are functioning well. And or administrative controls, such as persons not coming to work if showing symptoms, staggered work hours, and personal protective equipment, such as wearing masks, which should be available at the workplace. And of course, there should be policies in place to encourage persons to wear personal protective equipment and frequent hand washing. So for our engineering controls, we would want to review ventilation within the workplace. So we have to look at things like whether or not the existing air conditioning system adequately filter air from work for one from one workstation to another. All right, compartmentalizing open plan areas. So in our workplaces, the modern concept of our office space is to have an open floor and plan situation. In these instances, our engineering control would require us to set up physical barriers to prevent persons from coming in contact. So it's more encouraging physical distancing, social distancing within the workplace, preventing persons from coming in contact. We have to look at things like increasing space between desks. So that may require reducing the number of desks inside an office space. Um, you may consider implementing a one-way system. So you have a stoplight traffic system in the workplace persons can only walk one direction we would have seen it mostly in our supermarkets as a means of protecting workers and customers in our supermarkets they would have implemented a one-way system where you walk one way down the aisle and you pretty much would not be going backwards in the aisles all right we want to maintain distance of at least one meter between people and refrain from physical contact with others. And this includes coworkers, supervisors, customers. And of course, implementing physical barriers. Stuff like these can be implemented in office spaces at our reception. So where it would have normally been an open space to protect someone sitting at a reception desk an engineering control would be to set up a, a physical barrier such as plastic or glass to prevent the customer coming in direct contact with the person sitting at your reception desk. Now for our administrative controls, these are things like our policies relating to our workers. So we want to train staff so they understand what is expected of them. That's a part of our administrative control. And with COVID, knowledge we will find is key to prevent transmission of COVID. So workers might not be familiar with policies surrounding wearing masks or policies surrounding um, being a, a primary contact or a secondary contact in contact tracing. It's important to train workers so they understand what is expected of them. If they become a primary contact, which is that they are supposed to report to, are they entitled to paid vacation? Are they gonna be on no pay leave? 
this sort of thing, they should be trained and encouraged to participate as required. So each person in the workplace can contribute to reducing the spread of COVID-19 at work. So it is expected that the workplaces will have policies and procedures to promote working remotely, if of course this is practical in the situation. Flexible work arrangement, these can be arranged to prevent large numbers of persons being in the physical workspace at any given time, they can be staggered working hours. Um, you want to enable workers to report if they are unwell or if they become unwell while at home or even at work. And this is one of the things that we have seen that affect the workforce since the pandemic has begun, where persons are more concerned about loss of economic benefit rather than the health implications of contracting or spreading COVID-19. So workers might be more reassured if there's a policy in place and they're trained with respect to that policy and they understand that they become a primary contact that they're entitled to whatever um, paid leave, if they're entitled to um, paid vacation, whatever the situation is. So it's good to have policies so that persons can be encouraged. And of course, there should be a support system to right. facilitate these workers to report whenever they have symptoms, not be afraid. Um, so they would report to their supervisors. They should be encouraged to report symptoms um, to public health if they become positive. And of course, my colleague Timothy will be looking at some of those situations before we end. All right. So we want to encourage and ensure that there's adequate signage in the business place. So whether it is signage relating to the one-way traffic system that we would have spoken about, um, signage relating to hand hygiene, um, to wearing masks, those are the sort of administrative controls that we're talking about. Um, train managers to monitor effectively. And of course, this would mean, you know, training managers to be monitors in the workplace to ensure that there is no gathering in, in communal spaces, to ensure that persons are maintaining physical distancing, to ensure that persons are wearing the correct PPE and of course, wearing it properly, all right? And of course, it's good to have pictorial signage in the workplace to demonstrate and show workers what is required. So we want to develop policies and procedures to promote working remotely and have flexible work arrangement. Persons are not to come to work if they're having any of these symptoms. So for example, fever, a new and persistent cough, loss of taste or smell. These are classic, classical signs of COVID-19. And once a worker display any of these signs, they are encouraged and required to report them to public health and to their managers. So as it relates to personal protective equipment, we know that face masks have been shown to decrease the spread of COVID-19 significantly. Um, they should be worn when working indoors and in close proximity to co-workers and clients or customers. Wearing PPE is one thing, but what we have seen a lot is that persons tend not to wear them correctly, especially in the workplace, in the comfort of their office spaces while interacting with coworkers. And this is where there sometimes is a breakdown and can cause problems in the workplace. So in contact tracing, many times persons will tell us that mm -hmm. They wear PPE while in the office, but it's not worn properly, or they will report that there are persons in the workplace who don't wear it or they don't wear it properly. So coordinate with staff to make sure they are trained on the company's PPE protocol and sufficient supplies have been ordered, that there is sufficient stocks in place. If you are working in an area where COVID-19 is spreading, WHO advises the use of masks indoors when working in tasks that do not allow to maintain physical distancing. So for example, in a bar, 
it might be very, very difficult to, to, to prevent physical distancing because there might be a lot of persons. Of course, with what's in place now, there's a gathering limit, okay. right? So <laughs> even in our bars, our salons and gyms, there, there should not be crowd beyond a certain number. But even with those numbers, it may be still difficult to maintain physical distancing. So in those cases, it's encouraged that persons wear masks. And of course, WHO encourage wearing masks in outdoor spaces that are crowded and distant from others cannot be maintained. Now, the most effective control measures, so while we would have spoken about the substitution, elimination, administrative controls, the engineering controls and wearing PPE, the most effective control measures are those that are combined. So you may want to combine your engineering controls with your administrative controls or engineering controls with wearing PPE, stuff like that. So you want to look at limiting elevator sharing. So if there's an elevator in your establishment or in your institution, in your office, is there a limit in terms of the number of persons who can use the elevator at any given time? This is a form of administrative and engineering control. You want to stop and prevent the use and sharing of equipment. So for example, persons who work in a call center or in, a, in, a, in an office space, are they sharing headsets? Are they sharing telephones? Are they sharing equipment? And what's the procedure in place to clean and disinfect those equipment between use? Or is there a procedure in place? So these are the things that office spaces, work, work environments, are encouraged to implement to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And I already spoke about staggered start time. So rather than having all your workers coming into the office at the same time, leave at the same time, we tend to be fixated most times, especially in the office space, on this nine to five, this 8.30 to five o'clock work arrangement. Now, with COVID, we have to realize and accept that the dynamics has to change. It is business as usual, but really and truly, it is not business as usual. So while businesses want to reopen, um, while we want to encourage persons to come and patronize our, our restaurants or bars or salons, we have to ensure that those measures are in place to one, protect your workers, and two, protect your guests and your, your customers. And of course, we want to look at measures to reduce the options for interaction among staff. Now, very, very critical to preventing COVID-19 is cleaning and disinfection. And we would realize that in most instances when there is a, a case or an outbreak of COVID-19 in a workplace, in addition to isolating the, the cases or primary contact, public health would usually make a recommendation to have the office space clean and disinfected. And usually it is done by a professional janitorial company. Now, outside of this, we are encouraging workplaces to have in place a routine and ongoing cleaning program. So it's not a program that is done once per week or once per month, but it should be ongoing within the workplace. And this is where we're saying it's, it's actually not business as usual because these are more regimental procedures that we're expected to implement to protect our workforce and to protect our guests. So of course our cleaning staff, they are critical to our COVID-19 prevention program because they're the ones who are protecting the environment and breaking, putting in that control measure within our biological triad that I spoke about earlier. So the environment and the, the interaction between the host and his environment. All right, so we want to ensure that staff are required to clean and disinfect works, workspaces. 
and they are provided, of course, with the correct PPE while using these chemicals. Um, make sure appropriate disinfectant is used and stored and applied correctly. So we want to wipe and disinfect, disinfect frequently. Frequency will be determined by assessing, of course, your usage. So high contact surfaces within the workplace, those are expected to be cleaned more frequently. So for example, in a bar, um, your counters are high contact surfaces. Everyone comes in, they touch the, the, the counters. Um, and that's, that's a critical area for transmission of COVID-19. So we want to ensure that these are cleaned frequently. You're looking at, for example, your doorknobs, your buttons on your elevators, doorknobs in your office spaces. Stairway, so, handles. stairway handles, those are touched very, very frequently. And this is why it should be an ongoing and continuous program to clean and disinfect these surfaces. So we have to have that in place. Make sure appropriate disinfectant is used. And of course, with using disinfectant, there comes other implications for persons who are using them. There might be persons who have certain sensitivities to these disinfectants. And again, the importance of PPE is critical because this, this similarly, wearing PPE to prevent COVID-19, we have to wear PPE while using these chemicals. So we have to ensure that these disinfectants are stored and applied correctly. Um, most chemicals will come with what is called a MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet. And this will tell you what the active ingredients are in these chemicals, how to use them, um, what's the proportion of these active ingredients and whatever PPE might be required to apply these. And it's for this reason why public health would have made general recommendations whenever we have a case within a workplace for the space to be cleaned by a professional janitorial company. So we want to make sure that there are stocks in place, that they are maintained, and persons are aware of potentially allergic um, reactions like dermatitis that may happen among workers when they're not used correctly. So of course, we're looking at transitory areas, communal areas. These are very, very critical, of course. One, with respect to maintaining physical distancing, and two, in relation to cleaning and disinfection. So as it relates to physical distancing, or transitory areas or communal areas, these are areas where persons are most likely, they're more likely to gather in those spaces. And it is important, for example, where I mentioned earlier that managers are trained to adequately and effectively monitor within the workplace. So these are the type of situations that managers and supervisors would want to discourage workers from gathering in these areas. So our transitory areas, these may include our corridors, stairways, escalators, lift and reception spaces. So in a gym, for example, persons entering a gym, they may tend to linger with it in, the, in the lobby space, um, communicate a little, greet friends, and this sort of thing should be discouraged. So in those spaces, we want to wipe handrails, door handles, door plates, and any other control panels with disinfectant. So in our communal spaces, these might include restroom, conference rooms, prayer rooms. So we should wipe surfaces such as tables, door handles, chair arms, vending machine, control panels, trays, and meeting equipment with disinfectant. All right, also remember that with the restaurant, canteens, bars, food hygiene and handling rules continue to apply. Now, in our bars, restaurant, food handling establishment, for example, we should realize that the same food hygiene practices that are required to ensure food safety, most of these measures are also applicable to the prevention and transmission of the transmission of COVID-19. So for example, 
cleaning food contact surfaces. That is a food safety practice, but it also encourages the prevention of COVID-19. Um, the use of proper cleaning of utensils, similarly, is an effective way of en ensuring food safety and also preventing the spread of COVID-19. So we're looking at all the contact surfaces within the food establishment, ensuring that our utensils and, and cutleries, they're, they're cleaned adequately and effectively between use and, sorry, right. Um, so we're looking also at hand, hand hygiene. So clean your hand, cleaning your hand is one of the most effective and important step you can take to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, you can use a, an alcohol-based hand rub and soap with soap and water to clean your hands. Now, depending on the size of your office space of your establishment, you are re required and encouraged to install hand sanitizing stations at various locations. So important, importantly, you would want to ensure that your customers, staff coming into the office space or within your establishment, that at the entrance, you would provide them with that sort of facility. So whether it is someone who is applying the, the hand sanitizer for them or there's a hand sanitizing station, it would be accessible and it's important as well to encourage persons to use these facilities where it is in place. So maybe someone at the reception desk to remind your guests coming into the, the office space to apply hand sanitizer before coming in, to encourage workers as well to apply hand sanitizer whenever they're coming into the workspace. Similarly, in our kitchens, in our bars, in our salons, we want for persons to be encouraged to wash and sanitize their hands between customers while they are handling food, right? It's important to clean your hands before entering the workplace, after operating on a client, after collecting money, after protecting a cough or blowing your nose, and of course, after going to the bathroom. So we have to ensure that those facilities are in place to encourage persons to wash their hands first. So you would want to ensure that there's a hand wash station in place. It's, it is conveniently located and accessible to all workers. And this would encourage them, of course, to wash and sanitize hands. And of course, it's important to encourage the practice of hand washing by installing signs to remind persons, of course, one, to wash their hands routinely, and two, to follow the correct hand washing procedure. So we want to ensure that the facilities are there in place to encourage hand washing. So in summary, for our control measures within the workspace, within our businesses, we have to revisit and assess our workspace. We have to use engineering, administrative, and personal protective equipment controls to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Ensure that administrative support is in place to support the return to work. Enforce a suitable cleaning regime in high contact areas and to recognize that people's experience will be different when workplaces reopen and take steps to support them. I will now turn over to Tim, who will go through some of the COVID-19 policies and protocols of the government. All right. So I'll just briefly talk about the lateral flow and about doing your uh, self-assessment. So the protocols and procedures, if you're a positive person, you need to report uh, your positive LFT lateral flow tests on the government website. We, 
there there is a time frame. So if you're vaccinated, you'd be in quarantine or isolation for 10 days. Unvaccinated individuals would be 14 days. If there is one or more household members or members testing negative in the household where someone is testing positive, the negative members may perform daily lateral flow tests for 10 or 14 days and is free to perform regular everyday duties. This includes going to work or school. The COVID positive member will have to receive a negative PCR test result after the 10 or 14 days before they can exit uh, quarantine or isolation. Once tested, individuals must return home and isolate until further instructions. You will be contacted by public health use about being released from quarantine uh, following a negative PCR. Oftentimes people receive that as an email, but you will still get a phone call from a public health nurse or somebody from public health just to officially uh, release you from quarantine. <laughs> You, you can access the My HSA patient portal for your test results with any internet enabled device. Example, your smartphone or, or uh, tablet. PCR test results are received by email, both positive and negative. Email serves as confirmation if required by the employer. Follow up calls are received the day before exit testing. And here are some of the categories, uh, some of the symptoms uh, that you may experience. There's the common symptoms, which would, which would be fever, more than 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit and chills. You will also have cough. Some people uh, get generalized weakness or tiredness. And of course, uh, loss of smell and taste, which are fairly common uh, symptoms for this Delta strain that is circulating. Uh, less common symptoms would be sore throat, diarrhea, aches and pains, red eyes, um, or conjunctivitis as some of you may know it as, a rash on the skin and headaches. The more severe symptoms, which we're recommending folks, uh, if they do have these symptoms, to call 911 and uh, be transported to the hospital via the ambulance. Shortness of breath or having difficulty breathing, persons with chest pains, loss of speech or ability or mobility, or even confusion, and severe persistent vomiting which would lead to dehydration and complicate things. Uh, so th those are the, uh, the symptoms for COVID-19. And uh, re we want you to report uh, every positive case. And here are some of the uh, resources. The Cayman Islands government COVID-19 frequently asked questions and, and treatment. Cayman Islands Government COVID-19 self-assessment. For further information, you may contact your own GP or the GP at uh, the hospital. The flu hotline, which we're using uh, locally, 947-3077, and also the flu email, flu at hsa.ky. And for persons uh, asking for recovery letters or or, or just letters in general, it's quarantine at hsa.ky. Uh, thank you very much. I think that is it. We'll hand back well, over to Will. Yeah, thank you very much, Timothy. And thank you, Cliff, um, for your excellent presentations. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can certainly put them in the chat. Um, I'll just go through a couple of uh, a couple of questions initially to get things going. Um, I guess the first question is obviously for those small business owners out there, the ones that may not have all of the you know um, procedures in place that maybe what Cliff has spoken about because of the size of their office and everything. Um, 
you know, what, what are your recommendations for those types of organizations? And should they work from home if they can? I mean, what, what other way can they operate their business um, and, and keep their employees safe? So uh, um, the, the first control measure within the hierarchy will, which is the elimination um, that sort of thing, working from home, ideally, that's the preferred measure to prevent COVID-19. Um, but that, of course, is where it's applicable in an instant where it's not practical for persons to work from home, whether the, the facilities aren't in place. Then we have to look at the other measures. So the staggered work hours, do we have everyone coming into the office space at the same time, or we have someone coming in 8.30 um, and they work on shifts. So they might work up to 12. We might not be able to eliminate the time spent in the office together, but we may be able to reduce it. And that can be a measure to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Um, so it has to be a, a combination of measures, the, the cleaning and disinfection, um, wearing PPE, those sort of things. So they would have to assess their work environment, their work dynamics, and implement measures that are practical to their situation. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving into the holiday shopping season. <laughs> um, obviously, we got the uh, Black Friday and all of the oh, yeah. different events uh, associated <laughs> with shopping. Um, maybe you can give some of the retail, some advice as to the retail controls that should be put in place for those types of environments, particularly the, the larger um, places. I mean, I'm, so I'm not sure. I've, I've seen some Black Friday specials coming out already. Um, but again, as you can appreciate, a lot of business has been suffering over the last year and a half. So they're very anxious to get their businesses back up and running. So any advice you can have that, that you'd offer? And, yeah, that, that's a very good question, Will. And especially in our situation now where we're having community spread, this is very, very critical. Um, in, in this type of arrangement, it's likely that you will have large numbers of persons coming out to, of course, um, capitalize on sales. Um, businesses will have to Limit, look at person. limiting the number of persons coming that are time. coming in at any given time. So whether they want to cap, I mean, we would have done this before. Um, last year during our lockdown when persons had to shop based on <laughs> last names, <laughs> that sort of thing. So it might be a similar situation. Of course, we don't want to um, limit persons being able to come out and, you know, engage in economic activity but limiting the number of persons coming in at any given time that's one method and of course i would encourage them to make it mandatory for all persons entering these establishments to wear masks and of course you know have persons monitoring um that masks are being worn and worn properly and of course hand hygiene um, i would have spoken about having hand sanitizing stations at the entrance to your business. So this would give you a certain level of assurance that persons coming in would have um, conducted the necessary hand hygiene practices to sanitize their hand, whether you want to um, install a hand washing sink, whatever it is. So assess your dynamic situation and implement the most practical um, measures, but um, crowd control, of course, would be an important one. Now, as you, as, as I think um, Timothy pointed out, I mean, there, there are different, different people respond differently to when, when they're infected with the virus, obviously, right? right? Um, can you kind of give us a kind of an indication as to the importance of that person reporting the results? To, to if, if they have a positive, you know, some people will have minor, minor um, impact. Okay. And so because of maybe they're an hourly paid worker, mm -hmm. they may not feel as as confident to, to report that to their employer. 
Um, can you kind of explain to the audience what the penalties are for not reporting something, um, both if, if for the employee and the employer who may be aware of such a situation? Yeah, there there are um, penalties, uh, fines for for not reporting. But however, I, I like to uh, always speak to the fact that one person in, a, in an office uh, that did not report may infect the whole office and it would negatively impact the business uh, with, with number of people being out. Uh, some people will become severely ill, although many may be asymptomatic, show no symptoms. Uh, but then you, it's wider than that. You're, you're, you're infecting or you have the potential to affect others even outside of your office, uh, children and vulnerable people at home, uh, especially if you have an elderly at home. And even if it's not you, it is your coworker that you're putting at risk and you're putting their family at risk and you're putting uh, the business with which you make your livelihood at risk too. Because once people start to hear about uh, you know, this particular establishment um, being infected, then, you know, they tend to uh, stay away. So there's a lot of uh, incentives there for you to report uh, besides being a, a good citizen. Uh, that is one of the things that I always try to harp on. Yes, there are fines. I think they're like up to $5,000 $5, for not reporting uh, an LFT or even if you are um, have been uh, diagnosed by PCR and, and is in breach. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's all about being a fairly civil society and, and respecting each other uh, well enough to, to do the right thing. And, and well, I, I believe, you know, I've been around the different retail outlets. I think they're doing a great job in, in terms of um, preparing, you know, for the, for the reopening. Yeah. Um, they put a lot of these measures in place. I'm just to kind of, again, some of the why I raise it is just the issue of, you know, uh, everyone responds to crisis in a different way and lockdown left an indelible impression on a lot of people. And they, they certainly didn't like lockdown. But um, reality is we, we certainly don't want to go back there at all. So everybody has to take those necessary precautions. So, so I guess... Are there any other questions from, from our audience um, as it pertains to your business um, in any of the sectors? Again, you can either put them in the chat or you can unmute your mic and you can ask them directly to the panel. Okay, I see Amanda said good morning. Good morning, Amanda. So the other one, while we're waiting for questions, is a, another question in regard to the role of public health. Um, do you actually go and do spot checks um, out there and, uh, and also provide consultation to some businesses that may need your help in setting up those protocols? Yes, uh, to... To the fact that we do uh, we do spot checks, uh, we but of course we're limited. Uh, we have uh, individuals like Mr. Cliff Robinson, an environmental health officer who used to do an assessments, um, various establishments, uh, helping us out in public health. We also have um, uh, other other individuals from let's say Travel Cayman, Travel Cayman that that do the the uh, monitoring of individuals that are in quarantine. However, uh, you do would appreciate that we are severely outnumbered and uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, check everyone at any time, but we have been investigating quite a number of breaches. Okay. Well, they have got, they've got a, got a couple of questions. Um, so is there an authority uh, where persistent breaches can be reported to? That would be you guys? Is yeah. Yeah. Yes, public health and travel came in. Okay. Yeah. And then we have an, a question from Amanda. Um, she wants uh, Timothy to repeat the guidelines when one person is positive 
in the household and the rest are negative. Okay, that's quite uh, easy, especially where uh, in the household, uh, you may have a mix of people that are vaccinated and unvaccinated. For the vaccinated persons, you would be in isolation or, or you would then use lateral flow. If you're negative, you'd use lateral flow. And when that's negative, you can resume to go to work or school for up to 10 days. Uh, for a person that's unvaccinated in the same house, use the lateral flow for 14 days but you can uh, go to school and work. But once, uh, yeah, one, once positive, that person would have to remain at home, report that, and then everybody else will have to adhere to uh, continuing the lateral flow until the household is negative. Okay, excellent. Uh, but just... once, you, once you were uh, diagnosed by lateral flow as being positive, once you receive the positive lateral flow, you, you, the, the lateral flow test kits will no longer be useful to you because they have done their job in detecting when you're uh, most, uh, mo most sick or most infectious. So you would have to then exit quarantine by a PCR test, okay. the individual in the household, yeah. And just to remind everybody that uh, Timothy is the senior public health surveillance officer. So um, I think that was somebody asked you know, for, for me to repeat what your, your position was. So there's another question is, uh, where an office has an open plan and no shields between stations with 100% staff uh, required in office, is it safe for the staff to sit at their workstations unmasked throughout the day? No, obviously not. <laughs> okay. So if you don't have um, shields up, you should be wearing some protective mask uh, if you're at work. Mask, and if, if you have a face shield, wear that as well. Because okay. depending, depending on where you are, maybe uh, you're higher up, but if people are walking over you or coughing over you, you'd want to have uh, that added protection. Absolutely. Are there any other questions uh, from the audience as it relates to your, your business? Yesterday, we had a great uh, webinar regard, regarding tourism. So we've broken this one down to be a little bit more specific into the workplace, re retail, and office. So I think the question that was asked about those op op um open floor plans is, is a pertinent one because there are many offices in Cayman that have those open floor plans. All right, well, if there are no further questions, I'm not gonna hold anybody up for the rest of the day, that's for sure. I uh, just wanna thank Cliff. Um, I know Therese is there and obviously Timothy as well for sharing your insights and advice on best practices to follow for COVID safety in the office, service, and retail sector workplaces. Uh, the Chamber encourages all organizations to stay up to date with government regulations as we work together and navigate the challenges brought by COVID-19. Uh, we'll be sending an email to today's attendees. That will include a link to, so you can rewatch today's presentation if you wish. And the webinar sessions will also be available via our website and YouTube channel. So, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you for, to our presenters, Cliff, Therese, and Timothy, uh, for your excellent presentation. And I hope everyone has an enjoyable day. Thank you, too. Thank you. And uh, thanks for facilitating this, Will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.